I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for coming out. Uh, hope you're all having a great week and whatnot. Um, this is the talk of being better at being better, uh, where in essence we're going to go into techniques. I mean, initially, uh, I kind of pitched it as like a preaching the values of measurement and stuff, but as it was coming out and manifesting, it wanted to come out more in like, here are techniques to help you become the kind of person who you want it to be, and kind of crystallizing a lot of the things that I've learned uh, as of late. Um, and if, it's been really encouraging to see these techniques being cross-referenced, like not only in uh, my work life, which we're going to get into a little bit, uh, but also my personal life, which we'll also get into a little bit, uh, but also in a larger corpus of material in sort of like uh, like self-help books or like uh, like life coaching or that kind of thing. Um, it's been really encouraging. Um, this talk is a work in progress, not in the traditional sense that it's not done, but in that like there will always be more to learn from life and uh, and about each other. And so it, it like it'll keep being worked on, but. Um, this is the current incarnation, and it's the first time that it's been presented as such. Um, yeah. Uh, and it, it's really come from, like, stopping to listen a lot from, like, when, when you slow down a little bit, uh, you know, like, the, the universe and life gives us lessons and stuff, and so it's kind of the crystallization of all that. Um, and then we're going to transition and then talk about a little bit of a framework that Toyota uses uh, and one that I kind of came up with on my own, which has been pretty cool. Um, but first, uh, let me introduce myself a little bit. Um, started as a musician, I don't know, like 10 years ago or something. Moved into engineering, and now I also write words uh, as well as music. Um, Part-time nomad and mountaineer and climber and all these kinds of things. I'm currently at Pantheon where I do growthy things. Uh, transitioning from like the engineering side of things to more of the intersection of like uh, product and business and marketing and design and data science and all that kind of stuff as much because it's more fun to ask why than it is to ask how to solve problems. Um, so the genesis of this talk was sort of like three years ago uh, when I lost a dream job that was doing like meaningful work with extremely motivated people uh, and I only have one photo from uh, that time but this is my passport photo that was taken like the day after and so personified depression you can see that it was uh, no fun. And on account of like needing a visa to live in the States, because I'm Canadian, I spent a long time uh, unemployed. Like I was able to get a job, but then like waiting on a visa, and so like stuck in a holding pattern. So there's like really nothing you can do. It's like a really shitty situation. Became extremely unhappy and didn't really know why. Um, and started to read voraciously as kind of like an antidote for this or as a, as a remedy. And one of the one of the many books, and I'm gonna we're gonna go to like a couple books over the next whatever 40 minutes or however long we have. Um, but one of, the, one, of the, one of the most wonderful books that I read during that time was called The Rock Warrior's Way, which is, if you're a rock climber, it's like focusing on um, the mental game of rock climbing, which is like really applicable for those of us that do that. But it's also, I mean, it outperformed like Seneca and like all the Bushido texts, just on like raw applicability of like life lessons. And it was the right cocktail of tangential lessons, uh, passion, sheer insight, and application, which... Uh, it was pretty amazing, and one of the core tenets of that was to know yourself and to like learn your limits and that kind of thing. Um, so I started to do that, and started to dissect sort of why I was unhappy, and uh, realized that it was in part due to a lack of creation. And it's this broader theme of self-knowledge um, that I like to dig into a little bit. Um, and one of the one of the core tenets of that was that. Uh, life is kind of divided into two phases of one where we choose where to steer the ship and the other one of actually steering the ship. So it's kind of like that existential, like, what do I want to do with my life? And then I'm going to go do it. And it's like this kind of this beautiful juxtaposition of, um, it's a beautiful juxtaposition of like we, we, when we think we don't act and then when we act, we, we only think in sort of the service of that action. Um, and another one of the good lessons in there is that uh, something bad today, some misfortune today might prevent future misfortune. Uh, and there's like this classic Taoist principle of, or parable of, you know, a farm boy who like falls off a horse and breaks his leg and people are like, oh, isn't that unfortunate? And then the army comes along and wants to draft him to be sent off to a far land to be killed in battle and 
he can't go because he's a broken leg. And so, you know, broken leg wasn't that bad. Um, it's good. Fun little short story worth reading. Um, but as I redirected some of the energy that I would have spent working for someone else, instead to work on myself, uh, I started to value each other and people as more of like who we are because it's so, as opposed to what we do, because it's so easy to get caught up in kind of like that, uh, you know, like what do you do for work? And you know, that's kind of like where conversation stops at parties or at least in the Bay Area and that's kind of challenging. Um, but in this gradual opening, uh, things changed a little bit. So to quote Dan Millman, um, who's another wonderful author who wrote The Peaceful Warrior, which is another one I'd highly recommend. Uh, to quote Dan Millman, there are no ordinary moments. So then fast forward a little bit uh, and started at Pantheon, uh, which has been a wonderful place and you know they've become family and whatnot. Um, and I met this and I met this woman who uh, walked into my life and we spent a couple of years together and despite intertwining our lives and building a shared future, uh, building a house at Burning Man, talking starting a family and traveling the world together, uh, things were falling apart for a long time and one of the many casualties of that was uh, self-worth and uh, trust. Uh, in my own ability to do things. And so I was left with the question of how I could show so much love to someone else and yet none uh, to myself. And it was slowly destructive in the way that only true vulnerability can be when you kind of like let someone in. Uh, and in the end, um, it, was, it was pretty tragic. And so the point of all of this is to kind of, is to borrow a term from the Japanese vernacular of kintsugi, which is you can only be remade of gold essentially when uh, you're shattered in pieces and whatnot. So, uh, sometime after that, enter nomading. Um, I spent about a month working off the coast of Africa, and you meet some incredible people on the road. Um, people who just like walk their own paths with such determination, it's pretty amazing. Uh, and one of these people who I met was Peter, and this is him. Uh, and he was stoked on everything that I'd quietly begun to take for granted. Um, you know, everything, like, this is his first time out of Belgium, and so like, wow, like living alone, oh my God. And you know, it's so easy to get uh, jaded and cynical about things, but there's just like so many small, wonderful miracles about life that happen that uh, it's really amazing to just like stop and appreciate it. And uh, this photo was taken on the morning of his 25th birthday where we climbed uh, El Tiere, which is uh, this volcano off the coast of Africa to watch the sunrise and just to like witness kind of this, this opening of someone's mind and heart is pretty, pretty amazing. And so being an engineer and being driven uh, by knowing how things work uh, and reverse engineering everything that I kind of come in contact with, it was like, how can I recreate this feeling of just like sheer joy and gratitude and, uh, and just like wanting to like get more out of life? Because, you know, coming out of this like relationship and other things was like pretty dark period. Uh, and I realized that what I was struggling with was not experiencing enough uh, gratitude um, and not being present enough. And so I started to think about, okay, well, how can, I, how can I be more grateful? And kind of the answer was practicing. And then how do I practice? Okay, well, I guess explicitly call things out. Um, and so as much as, because being engineers or coders, I mean, you don't want to write uh, sorting algorithms from scratch all the time. You want to like, import a library and kind of the similar similar kind of philosophy uh, with this, it was like, oh, you know, this is really similar to uh, kind of like this, this breaking down of like complex ideas and problems and breaking it down into more tangible, tactile uh, things you can measure is a lot like what we do with debugging where it's like you have this complex system and you kind of dissect it and come to this point where it's like, oh, you know, this one line is inefficient or whatever. You know, it's this, it's this one uh, moment in the experience that's really turning people off. And so just by changing that, you can have a drastic and uh, profound outcome. Um, and so work class problems, like that one, or life class problems, like these ones, it all kind of comes down to the same thing. Um, and so I was riding this train from, uh, from Paris to Amsterdam and like, you know, one of those moments where it just kind of like flowed through me and wrote up an article, uh, which is sort of like the, the first incarnation of this talk, uh, which is on Medium, which is kind of at the end of this. Close my laptop and I was like, holy shit, this is profound. Um, so let's get into it a little bit. But first, water. Um, so let's talk about the importance of measurement. 
Um, measurement, in essence, is comparing something to something else. It can be two explicitly different things or the same thing over time. Um, and this is something that we are really kind of diving into and asking a lot of philosophical questions with uh, at Pantheon, sort of starting this whole like growth um, engineering process. Um, it was pretty, pretty interesting. These two uh, stock charts, just as an example, this is Sun Edison on the New York Stock Exchange. Seeing the first one, you'd be like, oh, maybe I can make some money on the upswings, but uh, only with the context of the second one, you're like, oh, actually they filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, and that would not be a good investment. And so here's an example, and of course, like the stock market is a great place to, uh, to philosophize around measurement. Um, and so you can't tell if a number is going up, for example, if you don't know which way is up, and you can't tell if a car is going faster, if you don't know which way on the speedometer, it means fast. So sure, you can make moves, but without uh, having something to compare against, it's hard to know what the outcomes of those moves are. Um, and this quote uh, is something that I was seeing like hanging around the Facebook office, which like, is pretty profound, but uh, it's a rocking horse, and it's, to quote Hemingway, not to, it's vital not to mistake progress from measurements. You can like rock back and forth, but without really knowing if you're actually moving needles, you know, don't know if any change is gonna be uh, permanent or sticking. Uh, and measurement in itself is an asset. Uh, as people, we become more creative when we have more constraints. And we, become, uh, we become more directed and, um, and whatnot when you know, we, have a, we have more of, we have like less free time, we're less paralyzed by choice. Um, and so where this kind of plays in is by keeping something top of mind, we become primed to see opportunities to improve it. Uh, this has been a lot of work done in the field of behavioral economics. Uh, if anybody's read Thinking Fast and Slow by uh, Daniel Kahneman and Reen Sversky, it's, it's really good. Um, and he talks about kind of, you know, just kind of this concept of keeping something top of mind and then once we're kind of thinking about it on a daily basis, kind of in the background of our thoughts, we start to notice it more and we start to notice uh, ways to improve it a little bit more. And so what's more is that not only is measurement a prerequisite to improving something, but it's also almost predictive of something that will improve. Just by keeping it top of mind, you know, we'll start to see improvements. Um, and, you know, as a fun anecdote, ben Benjamin Franklin had 13 guiding principles, and every month he would choose to work on one of them, but track all 13 of them. And he noticed that over time, even the ones that he wasn't explicitly, I'm not sure what these principles are, but even the ones that he wasn't explicitly working on, uh, he would improve. Um, and that's, that's pretty profound, that just by keeping something in the back of our minds, we'll start to find optimizations and whatnot. Um, yeah. So in coming back to the question of how to be more grateful, uh, I saw that what I was asking myself was essentially a four-step process similar to what we do uh, with trying to improve user experiences or debug things and whatnot. Also similar to sort of a, something that I've kind of distilled down from every like life coaching session or self-help book or whatever. Uh, but it's essentially like how to change a habit, right? So um, let's see, yeah. Um, in essence, about, it's about being able to recognize an input or an event of some sort, and then being able to kind of take this moment between the input and the output, that reaction, and choose how you want to react, and then actually reacting in the way that you would want to. And we're gonna get into techniques on how to do this and whatnot. Um, things that have kind of pulled together, not only from my own life, but other sources. Um, and then kind of reinforce that, that choosing to react in a certain way uh, with periodic check-ins. And is this motion progress? And it's kind of the same as the retrospective process and agile development. Um, and maybe I'm trying to force the, uh, force the analogy with, uh, with work a little bit, but I do, I do believe it's, it's fairly similar. Um, but it's real hard to stop a pattern completely. I mean, big changes are hard and we're not good at that, just as people. Uh, and so there's this idea of, of Kaizen, um, which is changing a little bit every day, compounding uh, changes like being 1% better. And this, this compounding change builds up to something profound uh, and becomes 
massive adjustments. And this is sort of, if you've read the Toyota way, this is how they perfected their engineering process over time. And the black box thinking, this is how, uh, you know, airlines have become far safer than, let's say, like the car industry, um, let accidents become so rare. Uh, and it's also something that, uh, at least in my experience in engineering, something we've replicated across like incident management and downtime and whatnot, it's just like, just try and be a little bit better every day and over the course of years, it kind of builds up to something that's profound. And so this is taken from the Wikipedia article on uh, that, but it's an Ishikawa diagram, also known as a fishbone diagram. And on the, on the left, on the right side, um, is sort of the observable problem that we're seeing. Uh, it's, it's the goal that we want to achieve, it's the outcome that we want to have, but it's, it's quite rare to have just sort of one driver influence a problem or a goal. Um, and so this is really this process of kind of breaking it down into, well, what are the drivers of that? What is indicative of the change that we want to uh, affect? What's indicative of the problem? And then kind of going into that, and uh, there's this technique of five whys, which is sort of the backbone of the Toyota way. Uh, which is also a really helpful tool for debugging, and it's, it's amazing how often when something breaks down, it comes to uh, not, say, a breakdown in infrastructure, but a breakdown in communication between people, which is pretty interesting that at the end of the day, we're all just like social beings, and um, you know, like how we treat each other is so deterministic of an outcome. Uh, and so I started to, started to th think about this, um, and saw that, sure, we're used to thinking about this in the, or at least in Pantheon and whatnot, uh, thinking about this in the domain of work class problems, which, uh, you know, how to improve performance at a very basic level, or how to improve uh, the experience on a particular flow, let's say. Um, but it's like, oh, actually, there's like life class problems. And so I happen to really enjoy Yosemite being from the Bay Area. And uh, how, so, you know, how can I spend more time there? Okay, so start to kind of go through that. Um, and then in the lower right is sort of what I was grappling with for the past for, uh, six months on how can I become more happy and like sort of what are the drivers of what make me happy and how can I affect those in small and subtle ways that uh, very tactile, but then build up um, through a combination of, of months and weeks and, uh, and years of effort to like kind of drive that happiness and the gratitude. So kind of breaking down this idea that, um, you know, there's these, these complex things that we want to affect and then working back through what affects that and then being able to, to work on you know, those core principles. Um, and I mean, that's all well and good to like, kind of say that in theory, but uh, it's also like real difficult uh, to kind of like learn yourself and know yourself and like understand these things. Uh, and then what's more is it's also real difficult to like commit to actually making like lasting changes. Um, and so this is where the importance of like friends and family and support groups uh, and coaches and mentoring all kind of comes into play. Uh, and not only to be a sounding board and to hold you accountable, but also to help like open doors. So uh, a good example, let's say, is uh, I'm, I'm trying to write a book, but you know, I just don't have time to do that. Um, and so I'm part of this mastermind group and like every, every month we show up and like, okay, this month I'm gonna write the book. And at some point, the guilt is going to push me over the tipping edge and just like write this thing so I stop letting all my friends down. Um, what's also really handy is I've got a good times crew photo of like all my like friends and family kind of on my phone, which is really helpful. I'm just like my friends like smiling back at me, and so when I'm like having a shitty day, just like flip through it and be like, wow, like you know these people are special, uh, and kind of like unconditional support because like the faces don't change on these digital photos. Um, and this is really where the difference between the good people in your life who are just kind of there and then the excellent people in your life who like kind of hold you accountable uh, and kind of like maximize, like really drive you to, to become the person you want to be just by like social proof and whatnot. Um, 
and kind of tangentially for work class problems, uh, it's one thing to kind of like learn yourself and so like life coaching really helps and having friends and whatnot. Uh, meditation is helpful. But for work class problems, this is where uh, like big data comes in and like data science and whatnot. Um, and also ethnography and user research. And what's interesting about those two things, kind of uh, tangential, uh, is that they complement each other really well. Like talking to people doesn't scale to hundreds of thousands of people, uh, but you get a lot of nuance. And then big data and data analysis and science, you lose a lot of nuance. Uh, even like the, the names of the, uh, the terms uh, imply as much, like we have like principal component analysis, which is like very clear, like, you know, we're gonna ignore everything but the principal components. Um, but all of these things kind of help us uh, determine the direction in that we wanna steer the ship. And so that once we know the direction, then we can start to execute and then we can start to, to act without thinking, except in the service of the action. Um, and it's also really important that kind of day to day it's really easy to keep measurement because if it's intrusive and it's hard, we're just not going to do it. Um, and that's been a lot of the been a lot of the problems that I've seen with there's like all these uh, apps to like help you um, help you kind of achieve your goals, but it's like it's real difficult to like every morning like wake up and be like you know go through your list of like 50 things and um, that's where I'm going to get into uh, to tools like physical tools that I use later, but yes, uh, real important to keep it lightweight. Um, and so ultimately, our aim is to influence, or at least my aim and hopefully your aim, uh, is to kind of influence yourself and trick yourself into being, uh, you know, the kind of person who you want to be. We all have these ideas of so, sort of our, uh, our uh, identities, and it's amazing um, how much gray area there is, at least I've seen this, um, between like who I think I am and sort of how uh, like other people perceive me. And it's like, wow, okay, I really want to like adjust that. And, um, and so luckily there's a lot of techniques that uh, the field of marketing, field of marketing is used that we can kind of hijack uh, and repurpose to influence us. Including, actually, so Robert uh, Cialdini wrote this wonderful book, uh, Influence. Um, and I should really really put a reading list at the end of this, but uh, Influence, while aimed at sort of the professional fields of marketing, it kind of goes through six principles of how people, um, how people like subtly influence you. Uh, and a couple of these points that are really salient, I've highlighted here. But to the point of identities, uh, our actions follow our sense of selves. Um, and if anybody is familiar with the Don't Mess With Texas campaign, uh, initially uh, the campaign was like, please don't mess with Texas because Texas is beautiful. And, but of course nobody's going nobody's gonna to pay attention to that because um, that's just like not who the Texan identity is. And so this marketing firm came back and they got a bunch of Texan icons to do these TV spots that are like very, uh, these, these icons are like, like quintessentially Texan people. And it appealed to the to the sense of identity of, you know, just like don't don't mess with this place, uh, and that became like one of the classic one of the classic uh, success stories. Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, Kurt Vonnegut also has this really good quote: "We are who we pretend to be," and so by subtly shifting our identities like bit by bit, 1% over time, um, our actions kind of fall in line with that because we want to be consistent with who we think we are. Uh, and not only is this true in the sense of marketing, uh, but this is also true in, uh, in life class problems. Um, another good one is commitment. And so by writing down what we want to do and by like kind of having these daily affirmations and goals of like, I want to do this, uh, we, I mean, if we value commitment and that's, uh, something that I think is, is pretty ubiquitous, but if we value commitment, then we want to, we want to follow through on these commitments and by writing these things down, it kind of affirms to us 
that like, this is something I'm going to do. And this is a technique that was used by the Chinese prisoner of war camps in World War II, I think it was, to get uh, American GIs to uh, start to uh, slowly accept the ideas of communism, where they would have essay writing contests. And then they would ask the GIs to write uh, just like something wrong with the states and capitalism. And then over time, uh, you know, their minds actually began to shift and like genuinely think that there was something wrong with the states and capitalism, like keeping uh, themselves consistent uh, to what they had committed to on paper, which is quite interesting that then a lot of, and apparently a lot of them still kind of have these ideas that they were encouraged um, to buy into from, uh, maybe it was the Vietnam War, but I mean, you know, from 50 years ago. And the alternative, right, is to just like torture someone, but that doesn't work. Um, so these are, these are like ways to make lasting changes. Uh, another good technique is social proof. And so we become an amalgamation of the people we spend time with. Um, and we kind of like settle into that norm. And there's, uh, to borrow a term from Drupalcon, there's that idiom that birds of a feather, right? Like you're going to kind of find your, your flock, you're going to find your tribe, and then adopt those kind of, uh, those cultural values. And, and over time, um, over time, like there, there emerges, uh, yeah, over time there emerges kind of this, uh, like group think, I guess, and people hold each other to the accountable that they're, uh, familiar with holding others accountable to. Uh, and so I've used this to great effect with the mastermind group, and this is the uh, this is kind of the idea behind that whole thing in general is that by um, that by I oh know it's hard to articulate. Um, yeah, uh, and this is also because I I like really uh, enjoy learning and whatnot, and so I'm keeping in that uh, I try and spend time with people in the environments that they thrive in, uh, and just kind of like pick up some of that stoke. So from the, uh, from the previous slide of hanging out with Peter in Tenerife. Um, shocking the system is also a good way to keep us honest and uh, keep us comfortably uncomfortable, which is kind of this beautiful area where we can stretch and grow to fill the gap, but not snap. Um, and there's a lot of room for like personal and professional growth there. Some people take kind of cold showers in the mornings. Uh, to like kind of shock the system enough to, and that would certainly uh, keep me uncomfortable. Um, but it's also a good way to bring to bring clarity. Um, when things get tough, we have this. It's interesting that we have this way of uh, just focusing on the on the salient things that are important. Also, traveling solo is a wonderful one. If you haven't traveled solo before, I'd highly recommend that because you kind of you kind of start to fill the gaps in your own sense of like what you can accomplish and what you're what you're capable of. Um, but really anything that gets you out of your comfort zone comfortably uh, is a great way to help you rise to raise the challenges. And like real danger comes from being uncomfortably uncomfortable. Uh, another good technique uh, is reframing challenges. And so there was that delayed gratification exercise that was done uh, in Stanford in the 60s. And one of the techniques that uh, one, of these, one of these girls used, which is quite clever, she drew a, f uh, a picture frame uh, if you're not familiar with that, it was, you know, I'll give you one marshmallow now, or, and you can eat it, or if you don't eat it, I'll come back and give you another marshmallow. That was sort of that exercise. And to help uh, trick herself, one girl drew a picture frame around the marshmallow, the first marshmallow, so that she kind of abstracted away the reality of it. And we can kind of do the same thing. And so I'm, one of my friends, uh, he's always had a problem doing his dishes until he started to reframe it as I'm not done cooking dinner until I've also done all my dishes. And now, you know, his kitchen is like super clean and whatnot. Um, but ultimately, I mean, there's no substitute for, for hard work and, uh, and self-love and like learning yourself. Like no one else will help you do this. It's all about kind of yourself rising to the challenge and, and taking the steps to grow. Um, and hopefully, hopefully in this kind of experience, uh, you know, you'll be able to take something away that you find useful and help yourself grow. Uh, these are a list of tools uh, that at least I use to help keep myself honest. Uh, coming back to that point of measurement has to be easy, uh, Evernote is incredible. It's, 
you know, it's just something you can like carry on in your phone, um, and then like go back and reformat on the computer or whatnot. But uh, the top, whatever, seven images, these are a list of things that like I want to accomplish, and it's like check boxes and stuff. Uh, I'm moving pretty slow through it, but uh, at some point we'll get there. But it's 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 uh, it's so nice to be able to uh, to like take these ambiguous kind of amorphous cloud of ideas and then just like make action items out of them and be like, no, okay, so like this is what I'm going to accomplish today, um, as opposed to being paralyzed by choice of like where can we begin. So at least what I found works for me um, on a daily scale. Uh, is I have a morning ritual, uh, and so this is a technique that's used by the army. But like making the bed every morning, even though it's like real simple, uh, you know, if you can't do anything else, at least you've made the bed. And so already the first thing you do is like you do something, uh, and you've accomplished something, and it like really makes it easier. The theory is for the rest of the day to keep accomplishing things. Uh, and then to this tune of practicing gratitude. Uh, every morning I kind of wake up and like call out three things that I'm grateful for for the previous day and then meditate and work out and do a bunch of push-ups and stuff. Um, but it's a great way to kind of like recenter uh, myself and there's something, there's something that's so uh, wonderful about practicing the transience of an experience in, like such as meditation where thoughts kind of like come and go and don't hold on to them. Uh, and it helps being mindful for the rest of the day. Uh, and then sort of at a likely future scale, uh, and this is something that I've read that like Tim Ferriss does also, is that uh, I had everything to my calendar, which makes it really easy to look forward, but then it also makes it really easy to kind of look back and be like, oh, I was really happy six months ago. What was I doing? What were the exact things that I was doing and who was I doing it with? Um, and I can see you know, like exactly what I was up to. And so if I wanted to recreate that experience, uh, could go hit those people up again or kind of like get back into that flow because we have such a, a recency bias, which is interesting. Um, and then also a note about bandwidth. Uh, sure, Evernote keeps me honest, and I don't do this, but a lot of people do this. Not a lot of people, some people, I guess. Uh, also, like project managing your life a little bit, so task management. At Pantheon, we use uh, Jira to kind of figure out like how many things can you keep in flight at the same time. Um, and for life things, you know, people uh, who have talked to you like use Asana more, I guess, because it's cheaper or free or whatnot. I'm not sure. Um, but you know, uh, estimating how much effort something takes, and this is also the basis for sprint planning and agile development. Uh, estimating the amount of effort that something takes and then historically seeing how many things you can keep in flight at the same time gives you a reasonable estimate of when will I be able to accomplish this thing that I've been wanting to do. And you can, so you can break down this amorphous goal of uh, whatever it is into a series of steps and then to a point where it gets actionable and you can start to, to work on those individually. Um, and what's also What's also helpful is that uh, project management tools allow you to keep a prioritized backlog of the things you want to do and what's important. Uh, and so that if you have spare cycles and you have spare time, uh, if you have like a spare like half hour in the day, then you can like just take a crack at like learning Spanish or uh, or like working on your night class or whatever it is, or like cracking on another website, whatever it is. Uh, and then yeah, at a longer term future scale, uh, got the Evernote thing. Um, and so something that my sister does to kind of keep track of this is that she, uh, she wanted to build a, a series of really healthy habits and so to hold herself accountable as much as anything else and kind of keep track of what those are. She has a spreadsheet uh, listing habits and days and then kind of goes in every day and like tracks them. Uh, and something about like the quantified self is pretty interesting for uh, at least someone as analytical as myself or other engineers uh, or you know, other analytical people in general. Um, Another helpful technique that can be used is uh, gamifying improvement and encouragement. So like Duolingo is a good example to go learn uh, foreign languages. Uh, just seeing like measurable progress every day is, is something that's uh, is incredibly driving. Uh, but ultimately though, um, you know, it's all about hard work and uh, there's no app that will be a silver bullet. I mean, change has to come from within. Um, yeah, and so a couple lessons, uh, this is kind of the conclusion part of this, but a couple lessons that I've learned from uh, growthy things focused uh, in work and then also kind of reflecting on this in life is that 
Um, measurement is valuable at every granularity. Um, some is better than none. I mean, we have an aversion to uh, starting something big, but starting something small is easy. You can you know, fit it in uh, five minutes here, five minutes there. But that kind of builds up over time, kind of like this Kaizen idea. Um, and then we get profound change. Uh, another, another salient point is that early and often will always beat slow and, uh, and incomplete, or slow and complete. And so it's a classic product distribution, right? Where like 20% of the effort gets you 80% of the way. Um, and mobility uh, is more important than stability. And being able to act and adjust uh, helps keep us honest and helps keep us tacking in the right direction. Uh, and helps us orient ourselves much better. And then uh, the importance of being open and that being open and vulnerable can lead to unexpected synchronicities and harmonies and can lead to just wonderful places. And uh, this is reflected in, uh, I mean, personal life, obviously, but then uh, in professional life, when we start to like dig into numbers, we may have like a gut idea of why something works. Um, but without looking at numbers, you know, there's no real way. But then once you start to look into the numbers, it's like, oh, well, this tells me that something is not working, let's say, but it doesn't tell me why something is not working. And so, uh, or, if, or if multiple changes happen at the same time, um, it's hard to kind of like go back and figure out what was the driving change. Um, and so openness is, is key. And, uh, you know, it's, as, much, as much as it's good to uh, answer questions, Measurement also begins to question answers. Um, and so I hope that uh, you learned something maybe about the, maybe got a good book or whatever. Uh, learned something about the Toyota way, the five whys, uh, Kaizen's. Um, I wrote up a little bit about this, the first incarnation on Medium, which is linked there. You can find me uh, for work things at uh, my handle hdom or life things at uh, is the Baron, um, Or just reach out and say hi. And then code sprints and so forth, and uh, feedback. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any any questions? Thank you all for coming. Thank you for holding me accountable to write this. Uh, I would not have written this if I was not going to present it, and so this is helpful for me also. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Um, the question was sort of around when you have something large that you want to tackle that's complex, uh, how do you go about breaking that down and fitting that in? Um, explicitly carving out like an hour every day to do it, if that's, is that something that you've worked on? <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. Um. <laughs> and failure certainly is a good forcing function. Um, I guess in much the same way that uh, if I were to go learn uh, Go, for example, um, I'd probably like take the approach that 20% of the effort gets 80% of the impact, and like that 80-20 rule is so so pervasive. Um, and so I'm not sure in your situation, for example, uh, if there's sort of like an MVP of the things that you can learn. Um, I mean, it sounds like you've already done a lot of reconnaissance on sort of the landscape of, you know, by, by doing this, it allows me to do these other things. Um, and I'm not sure sort of what the 20% missing, if you just, you know, put 20% of the effort in. And, um, I'm not sure what the 20% the lacking there would uh, enable you to do or not enable you to do, but um, certainly kind of like figuring out like what the what the core of what you have to learn is. Uh, also, the importance of like mentors and coaches are awesome, um, and even just like hanging out with someone for half an hour who's like kind of walked down this path before is incredibly value, or has has incredible value. Um, yeah, good luck. <laughs> Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, if you don't want to do it, then, I mean, if I didn't want to do it and you came up to me and you said, do this, I'd be like, no, man. <laughs> um, but if there's money on the line, for example, or it's an employee or whatnot, uh, uh, communication is so, communication and patience are so important. And being able to, uh, another great book, uh, Clayton Christensen, How We Measure Your Life, one of the, one of the salient, uh, I think, sentences from that, and this is, this is more of a book about parenting than whatnot, but uh, he went about his children's upbringing by creating experiences that they would learn from. And so in some cases, even setting them up to fail so that they would learn the lesson, to then be like, oh, maybe there's something here. Maybe I should listen to dad. So maybe that's a technique you can use. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to condone manipulation. But <laughs> I did. I did, didn't I? You're right. <laughs> uh, I'm, sure that's, I'm sure that's one answer. Um, I think people who are more drawn to the analytical mindset and like writing code. I think we're more in this vein of like, well, how do, how do I influence myself? Um, but then on the other hand, I've also hung out with people for a couple of years and they've never bit onto any of this, so. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe if there was a way to just incentivize someone to be more reflective about it. It's more about reflection, I guess, you know? Some people just like aren't ready for it. Some people have to like have one of those like crushing experiences to be like, oh, I really want to grow from this and then kind of looking into that. Yeah. Yeah. Intrinsic motivation. Yeah. Which is not something that you can I mean maybe it is something you can give to someone, but <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. Thank you.